Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Geek Warning, brought to you by the Escape Collective. I'm James Huang here in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm joined today by Dave Rome in Sydney, Australia. Hi, Dave. Hello. And we also have Ronan McLaughlin, who's back in Ireland after a brief little stint in Italy. Hi, Ronan. Hey, James. Uh, yeah, I was in Italy over the weekend, and I I got listening to last week's episode of the podcast uh, on one on one of my bike rides in Italy. Um, yeah, it was it was a, it was a good listen. I was a little bit disappointed that you didn't mention the fact that I had already covered DT Swiss Wheels in great depth about two weeks earlier. Um, I just happened to be talking about the wrong the wrong wheels. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, it was a great lesson there. Oh well, we 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 didn't have to bring that up because I I'm pretty sure we deleted that segment. <laughs> oh, we did. Yeah, we did. I, I just I thought it, I thought it would be amusing for the uh, listeners to know that I spent 15 yeah. minutes talking rambling. I would say about the the wrong new DT Swiss wheels. I was uh, I was witness to this. James James <laughs> threw it to Ronan saying, "Tell us about these new alloy DT Swiss wheels." Ronan then went on to talk all about a new gravel <laughs> alloy wheel. <laughs> While James was thinking, no, they're not gravel, they're Aero Road. And then they went back and forth for a long time without realizing that they're both talking about different wheels. I think we both realized some way very early into the conversation, but we kept it going until after the podcast <laughs> when both was checked and then realized that uh, I was indeed very wrong. D- we're Dave, professionals Dave. here. Dave, you've kind of blew the lid off of the, the, this myth <laughs> that we're perfect every time. Like the idea that we do these all in one take every, uh, every week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're all in one take, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, exactly why we just delete entire sections, such as the <laughs> DT Swiss wheels. In my defense, they were relatively new DT Swiss wheels. They just weren't the yes. newest. Yeah. We had not covered them. Yeah. Too, yeah ma- anyway. too many wheels to cover in general, but we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to the whole tech news thing in a minute. Um, Dave, standard question for you. Mm. Latest tool purchase. You know, I, I'm going to test to see whether our uh, whether Wade Wallace actually listens to this podcast because mm. uh, he actually influenced a tool purchase of, of mine, which is is somewhat ironic because he's uh, historically not not been a, a huge lover of uh, of the tool content. So uh, yeah, he uh, he showed me that he he I think he was kind of trolling me because he bought a uh, a Ryobi battery operated pressure washer for oh, washing his that. bike. That's right. And I, and I, I think you know I've I've written before about how uh, I'm not a big fan of using pressure washers to to clean bikes. Um, so he bought one, and then I'm like, you know, that actually looks pretty handy. So I bought one, and then quickly uh, cleaned my patio. So uh, yeah, I don't think I'll use it on bikes, but time will tell. Well, I was at my first cyclocross race in several years a couple of weekends mm-hmm. ago. I was not participating. Yep. I was just uh, it was our local club that organized it, so I was trying to help out. Um, and those. Battery operated pressure washers are kind of all the rage at the moment. Um, yes, in in cross. Yeah, yeah. There's certain race disciplines where uh, it absolutely makes sense to to use such a device and pressure washer bike. But uh, given I'm not racing, I can I can take my time and use a the gentle stream of a garden hose. <laughs> Well, thankfully, when I was racing here in Colorado, I usually didn't have to deal with a whole lot of mud. Um, but I can confidently say that if there well, if and when there were any races where there was a lot of sticky mud, uh, I'm pretty sure I remember using that sticky mud as an excuse to stop. So I don't really <laughs> think having one of those pressure washers really would have done me much good. In that you sense. just needed more bikes, James. Uh, no, I could have used some more mud so I could stop earlier. Yeah. Right. I'm, d- I'm done today. Sorry. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Anyway, we've got plenty on the run sheet today to keep us busy. We've got a super intriguing new low-cost indoor trainer from Zwift. We've got a new aero, but not aero. I'm very confused. Road racing bike from BMC. Uh, Mate Mahoric won the men's gravel world on a seemingly unreleased Merida that Dave's going to talk about. Uh, Princeton Carbon Works has us asking ourselves if stiffer mountain bike wheels are actually better. Is that what you want? Uh, and we're starting to see some more aftermarket drivetrain option, options for SRAM's new transmission stuff, if you can keep all the offsets straight. Uh, and then speaking of cranks, Shimano's crank recall situation might also be getting a little uglier, at least in the UK. We've got some thoughts on how we might be covering tech news a little differently moving forward. And we'll wrap up with yet another PSA. So without further ado, let's get into the news uh, Ronan, you and I are both in the Northern Hemisphere and summer's winding down. 
Uh, we're kind of starting to stare winter in the face in the not too distant future. So I think people are starting to think about indoor training. Uh, Zwift's got a new indoor trainer called the new Zwift Hub One. Uh, it's so low cost that it only has one gear. Well, sort of. Uh, Rodan, what is this thing? Um, I, I will let it pass that they have a new trainer, but technically they don't really have a new trainer. They have an upgrade to the existing Hub One. It's effectively the same trainer, from what I understand, with one of these things attached onto it. Um, and what I'm holding is effectively a free hub body with a single speed sprocket on it. Um, and then, well, basically two spacers either side of the single, single speed sprocket that obviously hold that in place, but also stop your chain if you do happen to shift from moving accidentally off the single speed sprocket. And the whole idea is Swift Hub, when it was in, what, about a year ago now that it was first announced or first unveiled, and the idea was to make it easier to get into indoor training, easier to get onto Zwift. And part of that whole concept that Zwift had was helping you know, this, uh, riders who maybe weren't entirely aware of what group set or how many speeds they had in their bike and all, just making all that entire process much easier, much easier to figure out which dropouts you needed. Uh, and now they've extended that further to do away with the cassette on the direct ride trainer entirely and replace it just with a single sprocket. And in doing so, they have introduced 24 virtual gears uh, that you can now shift with a new Zwift click, they're calling it, it's basically a handlebar mount that has an up button and a down button for, for changing gears. It also pairs to the Zwift Play handset things that they released earlier this year, wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. yep. And yeah, it, it basically just taking away the hassle of getting your bike mounted onto a cassette on your direct drive trainer. Um, and, and obviously you still need gears, so they've built that into the trainer now. So it's it's like any smart bike uh, you know, listeners will be aware of the well, the Wahoo kicker bike and Watt bike and the Neo bike and those sorts of things. They don't actually have derailers and cassettes and that in them. They use virtual gears using the resistance to to effectively mimic uh, gear ratios. And that's what Swift have basically recreated here. Uh, has that resulted in any price reduction or is that much the same? Or there, well, the it will now, if you want a new hub, Swift Hub One as it's been called when it's delivered with the single speed. Uh, that is priced at, I believe, €600, Euro, $600 or £550. Pounds. Um, whereas if you want to buy this single speed upgrade for your existing Zwift Hub, that's priced at €80, Euro, £80, pound, $80, uh, if I've got those numbers right off the top of my head. Um, which sounds all right, but I'm sort of drawn back to the fact that it is just a single speed sprocket. Um, so when you're paying £80 for that, okay, granted, you've got the click, where it, which changes the gears. Um, but um, I think what's most interesting about this is that looking at it in in future, I don't see any reason why this couldn't be expanded onto all their trainers beyond the Zwift, Zwift Hub and onto the likes of Wahoos or Taxes or whoever else might allow you. It's basically just a firmware restriction at the moment. There's no reason I could not attach this what I've got in my hand to any other direct drive trainer. You know, at first I was thinking that it, well, I like the idea of this, first of all. I, mean, I like the idea that Zwift is lowering the barrier to getting people to be able to ride on Zwift indoors or just to be able to ride year round sort of thing in general. Um, and I was originally thinking that there probably wouldn't be that many people who would buy the upgrade. Um, but then I started thinking about it some more and particularly for multi-bike, multi-user households, uh, especially bikes that have a bunch of different drivetrains, talking, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, mountain bike, different roller diameters and that sort of thing. Um, this sort of thing makes a lot of sense if it lets all of those bikes use the same trainer without a whole lot of change. Um, that, it seems pretty smart, actually. That's kind of what would interest me in having this personally is my road bikes are mostly 12 speed these days and my time trial bike is 11 speed. Uh, and so straight away, that's going to make it, I'm, you know, I'm not having to change trainers, a luxury position where I can do that. Um, I can have one trainer set up with this. And actually the Zwift Hub is the one I tend to use most often anyway, so that kind of works also. Um, but that that's the benefit I see in it. Obviously the putting a bike on an alpha trainer shouldn't really be a problem for a tech rider. Um, it's not, but uh, just the, the ease of use might be a, a gain. 
the other benefit is all the uh, 30 plus year old uh, now corporate living uh, formerly fixie kids can dust <laughs> off their old track fixies <laughs> and uh, get onto Zwift. So perfect. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, going Huge back to market. what Zwift have said about this, uh, multi-bike compatibility is one thing they've mentioned. Um, the other thing that they're saying is you're not going to get any missed shifts. Uh, so you can shift under power and there's no issues there, which I guess is true. But my problem, not my problem, I haven't tried this yet. It was here when I arrived home yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to, to try it yet. Um, the difficulty I have with all these things is the extra device that you're having to have on your handlebars to shift. It's like the, as much as I enjoy the Zwift Play handset things that came out earlier this year, they are you have to reach away from your levers. Um, you know, and, and I don't know what the answer to that other than, uh, is other than, you know, a dedicated indoor shifter, which then is obviously no use if you want to bring your bike indoors and outdoors. Um, the indoor bikes or smart bikes that I've used haven't really solved it either. Um, but until we've got like some sort of solution from the group set manufacturers and Swift combined that you can just, you know, um, hook your rear rear and connect Bluetooth to your shifters. Um, these extra devices on the handlebars don't really do it for me. It's like if you're if you're mm. racing or you're doing an interval or something, like that, the last thing you want to do is have to move your hand away from your levers to shift yeah. gear somewhere else. I I actually think a lot of the people likely to buy this are probably just going to use ergo mode, right? Like not use a shifter, right? A lot of those people would probably just keep it in one gear and just let the let Zwift vary your power for you you know if you do a training session or something like that in ergo mode am i am i wrong on that or is uh, is that kind of the idea here i i kind of feel like most of the people who are going to be using zwift are basically just going to be sort of like <clears throat> sort of just hopping into one of the worlds and just kind of like randomly pedaling around that seems to be how most people i shouldn't say most but that seems to be how the majority of people use zwift i mean there certainly are a lot of people who are using uh, like dedicated training programs and racing and stuff like that. Um, but I think for the target user for this sort of thing, you know, they're not going to be most likely the the serious super user. <clears throat> they're not going to be the ones who are you know most concerned about accurate wattage uh, readings and that sort of thing. And I don't know how much they're really going to be bothered by an extra button because it really does seem like most people these these days just kind of like general population. I would say. Um, they're probably used to just having buttons and remotes and stuff all over the place. Mm. The uh, I was just checking my emails. I actually had a reply from from Zwift just well earlier today. I've only just seen it now. Um, and interestingly, they have mentioned the torque setting for putting this back together after I took it apart earlier today and didn't use a torque wrench to put it back together. So. Uh, uh -oh. That might be interesting. Uh, um, no, it's 20 Newton meters, so I'm pretty sure that's fine. Uh, the other interesting thing is one of the questions I asked Swift was given that the click is compatible with the play handset and the virtual gears are a virtual thing, so it's it's a you know it's a game and trainer combination. Uh, if you've already got the trainer, you've already got the the game. Is there any reason Swifters couldn't just do without the single speed and use virtual shifting with their play controllers at the moment um, and seemingly there isn't any reason that you couldn't do that you could just use your Zwift play uh, handset at, to do shifting when they release it later this week I mean you, you could but the, the way this it probably goes back it's worth just mentioning how this works is that the trainer will actually work out what gear ratio you're currently using, using your cadence and the flywheel speed. And then it creates 24 gears from that. That should be the same across different, it should be, feel similar across different bikes, regardless of what size of front chainring you're using. Um, so if you were to use a standard cassette and derider and you were shifting mid game and then you're using virtual shifting at the same time, that would probably mess with it. It would confuse the entire system, so your shifting wouldn't be all that nice, I think so. Or, or, this could finally be a way that someone is able to get their, like, 
hundred bazillion speed drivetrain that they've always dreamt of, but <laughs> couldn't really actually replicate physically. You can just keep your your two by twelve drivetrain, but now run it with twenty four extra virtual gears. This is there you um, go. virtual CVT. <laughs> Done. Continually Done. variable transmission, continually confusing your Zwift hub by changing oh, gears man. virtually and reality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Ronan, you can maybe have a play with that and see if you can actually get that to go. I am looking forward to hearing what you think about that thing. Yeah. Once you've able, once you're able to actually get some time on the it. The only the only real concern I have was if it's using resistance to mimic gears, is that going to affect your how you use Eric mode? Uh, and Zwift have told me it, it won't, uh, which I mean is kind of the same as smart bikes. Although I've never been a fan of those, so um, I'm I'm interested to try this. I I don't see why it wouldn't work. I don't see why this won't be a good product. Um, you know, especially for the target market, just making it easier to get into Zwifting. I think can only be a good thing. Well, we will find out soon enough. Uh, next item in our list of news today. Uh, so we've certainly been talking about Shimano's crank recall uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think the last time we talked about it was maybe a couple of episodes ago. Um, and when we first talked about it, it's, we kind of guessed back then might happen. So things are getting a little ugly. Uh, so uh, Cycling Weekly actually just wrote an article talking about a new government report in the UK that declared Quote, the affected products do not meet the requirements of the General Product Safety Regulations 2005, unquote. Um, that in and of itself is not entirely surprising, given that these things seem to be coming apart uh, with some relative regularity. Uh, apparently, however, this opens up the company to liability lawsuits now because uh, Shimano's planned course of action isn't actually protecting all the affected customers the way it's supposed to, since not every crank set's being replaced. Um I have to think this is just kind of the opening salvo in what is sure to be a flood of liability and lawsuit issues coming Shimano's way. There seems to be some happening in the US as well, calls to class actions and all sorts of uh, big bad things that uh, as a consumer, I think, unfortunately, you know, we'll probably end up wearing those costs for years to come. Yeah. So, um, so our own Joe Lindsay, he's working on a pretty detailed article looking at some of the more nuanced uh, issues surrounding this recall. Uh, there's a whole bunch though. I mean, there's things down to like eroded resale value, even for cranks that aren't failing. You've got kind of questionable safety, even if the cranks are deemed to have passed the inspection process. Um, you know, you've got questions about shop liability since they're the ones who are mm -hmm. actually doing the inspecting. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of stuff that is happening here. Like I, I certainly have several cranks that would fall under that recall, but they're not physically separating. But I don't know if, I mean, I guess I'm still comfortable riding them, but I don't think I would ever, th that sort of thing is certainly still going to be in the back of, the, back of my mind. James, if you were, would, would you go out tomorrow and do, if you had a 1500 watt sprint, would you go out tomorrow and do one comfortably? Uh, and confidently. Well, that's, a, that's a big hypothetical, given the fifteen hundred watt measurement. Um, no, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I would. Yeah. No, because the thing is, the the the, the problem is confidence, right? Yeah. I mean, even if, even if I knew, even if Shimano could absolutely certify without doubt that a crank that is not physically coming apart but still falls under the recall is safe and can withstand that kind of effort. The problem is the confidence in the product is so heavily eroded at this point that I don't know if I'd want to. Mm. I I get that. I, I see it from a different point of view, which is I guess I've seen firsthand a, a handful of these cranks now and how they fail in the failure mode. And I kind of, I still have complete confidence to ride a product that passes the visual inspection. I just, my issue with it is it's like <clears throat> at some point that crank with enough use and enough exposure to to salt or to water probably won't pass that visual inspection. And it's, you know, how do you know when that crank hits that point? And if here's a hypothetical question for you then, Dave, just, you know, in the, in the interest of balance, you get a question each. Uh, if you were doing <laughs> that visual inspection and the customer was reporting a random noise from their bike that they couldn't pinpoint yeah. and you couldn't pinpoint that noise. Uh, and I'm actually speaking yeah. about a, 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 an actual scenario that I know of happening recently. Would you then be confident in saying, well, it's passed a visual test. I, I, you know, I can't really. I mean, it, 
if you'd done everything else at that point and you really can't figure out where the noise is coming from, I mean, at that point, I'd probably just be saying, let's send the crank back to Shimano mm. and have them inspect it and, you know, completely rule out that this is not the issue. Mm. Right. But again, that kind of boils down to this issue of confidence, right? Like that even it, it, it just feels like, I don't know, like I think for a lot of people that would just kind of mess with, your, mess with their heads, right? Yeah, I, I, but I, I honestly, I believe that people losing confidence in this product is a lack of understanding as to how these are failing. It's not, it's not like a, a straight up structural flaw in the crank. It's, it's really like from what I've seen, it's corrosion that that causes these structural issues. Uh, so if your crank looks perfectly mint, it's in theory, it's still as good as new. Uh, Whereas the ones that I've seen fail, like really do tend to look pretty nasty and are pretty obviously failing through, you know, a lot of corrosion and the bond, the bond seam is very obviously open and splayed apart. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like I think people saying like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm kind of of the mind that I'm happy to keep riding these cranks as long as they look great. The problem is, is that there's millions of cranks out there being ridden by people that don't know what to look for exactly. and that's the worrying yep. part yeah yeah um so anyway uh like i said i think this is going to continue to get ugly before uglier before it gets better mm. um we're going to continue to keep an eye on all this but um yeah maybe not going super smoothly um Moving on to something that did go a little more smoothly, I think. Mm. Uh, so, Ronan, Ronan, as we already mentioned, you were gone for a few days last week. Uh, you were out in Italy checking out BMC's new Team Machine R. Uh, so, I'm not going to go through all the details on that bike because you can check out Ronan's very in-depth article over at EscapeCollective.com. Uh, I do want to ask you, however, about BMC's insistence that this isn't an aero road bike, despite the fact that it's very clearly an aero road bike. What What are they doing there? Um, I will say first of all that I agree with them. Um, as much as this looks like an aero bike, their BMC's point was very much that when you say aero bike, it comes with some sort of negative connotations, and that aero bikes typically were much heavier, typically didn't ride all that well. Uh, typically the type of bike if you're a pro rider you took for flat days or whatever, whereas they're like this is this this has developed to be their fastest bike that they've ever produced but it is also not just an aero bike it is a lightweight bike it is made for every stage not just flat stages it's made for climbing it handles as well as their team machine slr um so the point was the point was very much you know this isn't an aero bike because it's not it's not called the team the time machine for that reason because it's Although it replaces the time machine, the time machine is done away with. This is like team machine race. Whereas I'm reading between the lines to mean to to assume that that means in future team machine SLR will be I don't know some sort of Athos BMC or something to that you know that lightweight uh, option that probably won't be chosen by their their professional riders for road racing. So. If I were someone at another company, let's say Specialized, for example, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't they maybe just sort of present the counter argument that uh, this Team Machine R is basically just like a Tarmac SL8? I was about to answer you there, and I, I, f I feel like I'm been drawing drawn into being their BMC representative on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> and defending, which I, I very am um, very much I'm not, uh, but I was very much enjoying riding that bike and part of what i was enjoying most about that bike was that quite often whenever i'm looking for a bike obviously being a bit of a performance nerd i you know low low weight is important to me but also aerodynamics are important to me and i think if we i've mentioned it briefly on and on your mind recently was like all these do it all all rounder light aero bikes that we've seen recently to me are heavy aero bikes they're or sorry, heavy climbing bikes, um, and that they're not super low weight because they they have to meet this six point eight UCI limit anyway. Um, but they're also, you know, uh, quite a lot of them are sort of you know they've got aero 
tweaks to them, but they're not really outright aero bikes. And there's quite a lot of, if I was looking for a purely aero bike, I would feel that there there's a lot of shortcomings on these sort of <clears throat> all-rounder bikes. Whereas what BMC have created here, if I was looking for an aero bike, a standalone aero bike that had no weight considerations, it would still be near the top of the list of bikes that I'd be looking for. But it's not an aero bike, Renan. I know. <laughs> I am disregarding that statement. <laughs> you can't pick it as an aero bike. It's not an aero bike. Well, if I if I was looking for an aero bike, this would somehow break onto the list of bikes that I would be looking at, despite not being an aero bike. That that's my point. Right, is so that you'd be picking this not aero bike? Okay. Yeah, be, because yeah, yeah, I don't feel there's any huge aero. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, begins with con. Trade off. Uh, concessions lost <laughs> there is mm. there are no huge aero concessions on it they haven't like you know done away with the deep bottom bracket or they haven't done away with the deep head tube or they haven't you know they're they're everything about it is built with aero in mind but it also is pretty light you know i'm, I'm reluctant to say pretty lightweight because there'll be somebody saying it's not lightweight it's over seven kilos i understand but in terms of if you wanted to get a bike to the uci weight limit this would probably the, the closest thing that i can compare it to in terms of aesthetically aero speaking is probably the Cervelo S5 but that bike when I reviewed it was over 8 kilos this one you you know if you were building it from frame up you could quite easily have had 6.8 I believe okay so it's a propel uh, <laughs> I, I would say a propel I, is um, <laughs> is on the list as well but there there are concessions there on the, on the propel as much as I like the propel it's um i would say the the new team machine or is an aero bike and the propel is nearly an aero bike no it's not no it's not an aero bike run. <laughs> <laughs> part, part of me wonders part of me wonders if bmc if someone within bmc's marketing department just had this idea of hey everyone let's just tell people that it's not an aero bike because it's just because it's just going to completely um, mess with their heads to be to be fair so we had the entire presentation on the i don't know it must have been the thursday um and that went down for a couple of hours and then we went for a bike ride um rather concerningly the bike ride started at the top of the madonna de Gisallo climb um which is an eight kilometer descent with multiple switchbacks and um a sheer drop down down one side of the road so um bmc were quite confident in the handling i think i referenced that in the piece but uh i, I found that strange to set us all off at the top of a descent <laughs> for the start of a ride um I, I've been trying to rack my brain to remember how much they actually referenced this in the, the presentation. There was some reference that this is not just an aero bike. This is a race bike. A, a redefined race bike was a tagline used. It was more so 24 hours later when I was being a right pain in the rear end and asking for interviews with pretty much every BMC representative there. And I sat down um, with... Um, one of the head of products from BMC. And I started off by mentioning the new aero bike. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not an aero mm-hmm. bike. Uh, that was, and, and then he like spent a, a good few minutes explaining to me why it's not just an aero bike. Uh, that, that's where, that's where that came from. It, it, they weren't, they weren't really leading with that to be fair to them. Would Red Bull say it's an aero bike? Um, I think uh, that that's that's you know for all the talk about everything on, to do with this bike, I think that's the more interesting question because BMC have there's nothing unique about what they've created in any one you know aspect of it, but put together, um, and when you take the different stats about this bike, I think there are elements of it that are unique, and what is I think especially refreshing about this bike is that it actually is identifiable even if you like blacked it out like we've done in the past you could identify this frame versus others that would look the same um and the question for me is you know given that bmc did work so closely with um the a division of a formula one team presumably at huge expense to do so is that where bike manufacturers are going to have to go in future uh, like I, I asked bmc what 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 was the value in doing that? And pretty much, you know, if I sum it all up, pretty much the value in, in using Red Bull Advanced Technologies is not just their expertise, which is obviously vast, um, but just in terms of the, the the human resources they have, the amount of engineers and experts that they could 
put onto this project. On top of that, the amount of computing power that they have. If BMC were try to, to try to replicate that in house, it it just it wouldn't even be possible. Never mind financially viable. Uh, the skeptic in me also believes there's a, a lot of marketing value oh. in having <laughs> Red Bull F1 linked to your bike design, just as McLaren was once linked to uh, yes. S Works. A hundred, a you know, hundred percent. History, the history is long on that. You know, Colnago mm. and Ferrari, and mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's something to consider, and I think BMC's linked up with Lambo in the past, maybe, but more, yeah. but not in a design, more in a collaborative kind of. Uh, let's find a way to charge fifty thousand euro for a bike kind of way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I yeah, think like yeah, and then Colnago, yeah, of course, and Ferrari and that sort of thing. Yeah, like all sorts yeah. of automotive collaborations. Yeah, um, I think there's there's immense marketing value in in these collaborations beyond design but it does sound like red bull actually you know was more than that yeah i 100 agree the marketing opportunities are, are immense um i i did get the feeling that there was more to this process than than just achieving a marketing objective um and that to me is actually a bit worrying because if the fruits of that partnership are not just marketing but are actually tangible in terms of a better bike are all our manufacturers going to go the same way? And is are suddenly is that an, another avenue of adding two, three thousand pounds, euros, or whatever mm. onto the cost of a frame? Mm. Mm. Uh, speaking of Red Bull, um, can we talk about the handlebars that are the 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 width of the handlebars equal the height of a Red Bull can? <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be two. I think it might be two cans, Dave. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I mean, you have two hands, so that makes sense. Yeah uh yes uh, uh, like obviously they're grabbing a bit of attention now but these bars did exist on the time machine road already um which yeah. i think my hope is that there will be more sizes in future the fact that these bars have already existed on the time machine road tell me that that is not coming because if and, if more and sizes, a similar bar on the chaos Kind of uh, bike, yeah, I I said in check of similar concept uh, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it probably it could I mean, well be the it's same. It's something that we're seeing on a lot of bikes. I mean, like the like the most recent Trek Madone, for example, that thing comes with stock mm. thirty six mil bars, um, well, at least in some sizes, I think. But uh, centimeter. It, sorry, yes, <laughs> thirty six <laughs> centimeter bars. Um, what are but, these uh, bar, bars for ants? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, anyway, point being that that uh, for high performance aero, not aero, maybe aero bikes, that um, handball widths are getting narrower. And like, is that it's that something that we think is a good thing? I I think it's a bad thing that we're not having more options. But I think it's a good thing that if we're going to stock a size on an aero bike, I said aero bike, aero bike. Then so we're not should, talking about the BMC now. It it, it should be this narrow. <laughs> I mean, the, the comparison for me again is that Cervelo S five, and you know all the concessions they made with that. You know all the concessions you make with any race bike in terms of reduced uh, ride comfort, uh, increased stiffness, increased weight. Usually, all those things. If you're going to make all of those, why then detract from that with a forty two centimeter wide handlebar as was supplied by the S five? I think BMC yeah. have fallen. If they're going to stock a set of handlebars, if it's going to be a stock size, it should be narrow because the rider buying this bike is more often than not these days going to be inclined to be riding narrow handlebars anyway. The the point where it falls down for me is the fact that there are no other width options, especially when there's so many st- stem length options. It seems like, you know, could there not have been yeah. an extra, uh, even one other width option? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that's definitely a, a shortcoming. And but yeah, I totally agree with you. Like I've been testing the the Tarmac SL8 recently, and one of my only complaints of that bike, it's a fantastic bike, but one of my only complaints is that yeah, the the stock handlebar is a forty two on a on a fifty four centimeter frame, and it 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 feels wide to me because I typically now run forty centimeter bars on on all my personal drop bar bikes, but uh, but it also for the for the purpose of the bike, it, it seems out of place these days. It does seem like, you know, you've got all this effort of making a, a speed sniffer and making all these aero claims, and then you make the rider wider. It just mm. doesn't doesn't add up. Mm. Uh, the I I wasn't a huge fan of handlebars. It wasn't because of the width. It was more because of the the flare on the drops, which mm. just doesn't do it for me. Yes. I like the 36 centimeter width at the hoods. And yes, I like the idea of having 42 at the drops. It 
you know, gives you more control and descends now or when you're in the drops. What I don't like is the fact that the flare also flares your levers. And I don't know mm-hmm. if I'm old fashioned or I don't know if it's because I've broke wrists in the past or what, but I only feel right when my levers are straight. Uh, I don't feel I can get the same pull on the, the levers when I'm out, especially when I'm out of the saddle when they're, when they're flared. Um, you know, it's nice. So they're, they're it's, flaring, they're flaring the drop before the lever. Is that Yes. Yes. Happening? Whereas yeah, some other okay. drops yeah, so, are flaring it after the lever. Yeah, yeah. Sort of in more traditional style. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Ronan, I definitely hear where you're coming from because I feel like I have that issue a lot of times too, I guess, especially for more gravel oriented bars where the flare is more pronounced. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, I guess we are seeing somewhat more pronounced flares on some road bikes now, just because the width at the hoods is so narrow. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen brands like, uh, 3T, for example, is one that, that comes to mind right off the top of my head where they, where they did the flare below the hoods. Um, and that, that does strike me as, as a pretty good way to go, particularly since a lot of modern levers already have uh, brake lever blades that are flared out slightly. So then when you put that onto a flared drop handlebar, that flare becomes even more pronounced. And then all of a sudden we're getting to the point where I'm like back in college and running a neat, a neat mustache bar. <laughs> uh, I would say that the Aero Coach Ornix bars probably do the best job of allowing you to set your lever straight if you want, but keeping the drops flared out. So you, you've kind of got the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, like it even, we've mentioned it before, I'm not going to open the, the harness nest again, but I just don't feel like I've even got the same reactionary uh, skills on getting on my brakes in an emergency when my levers are that angled. And and like I, w- I was trying to yeah. run them as straight as I could. The problem when you try to straighten them on such flared drops is they're re- your levers, levers are either pointing out and it just looks ridiculous and doesn't feel right, or they're pointing way in. And yeah, uh, opinion stuff yeah. around how it looks when they're pointing in. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually kind of, I've ridden some um, marginally flared handlebars on the road and quite like them like in sprint situations where the wider bar kind of, I guess, helps support the core a bit more than what you do with a, you know, a narrow handlebar, you really have to hold your core quite tight because the the bike becomes quite twitchy and tippy. Um Whereas yeah, that wider handlebar gives you a strong, uh, wider base to to pull from, I guess, um, mm-hmm. and it also gives you the wrist clearance as well. Uh, but what I've also found is that it's very easy for that flared shape to feel to all of a sudden become quite quirky in its feeling. Like there's there's only a couple of degrees difference between feeling like oh yeah, this is of benefit, and then oh yeah, mm-hmm. this is just weird, and I can't reach the levers as well as I'd like. And and not to contradict myself, but that's where on the arrow coach bars. Because they only flare out at the very end, it, mm. it it is it is it certainly takes longer to get used to than you know the flare. If you could somehow have the flare from the you know a standard flare, but keep the lever straight the way Aerocoots have done, um, yeah. So it, it clearly it's not a simple fix because you still have to be able to get your clamp or your shifter clamp around whatever you have at the at the end of the bars. Um, you know, so you, the deviation there can't be too severe. Um, but yeah, I don't know. More more handlebar options, please. Which gets me to my final point in this. Why BMC let Red Bull loose on the entire frame and fork and didn't let them loose in the handlebar, which tells me perhaps there's a handlebar coming in the future. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to guess they ran out of money. Yeah, they had the handlebar. They wanted to use the handlebar. <laughs> Having those molds made with multiple stem lengths is not cheap. And they're like, let's make it work around this. Hmm. I, and I will say though, at least uh, while the the top end complete models obviously come with the the BMC full one piece, fully internally integrated uh, handlebar setup, there is a two piece bar and stem option. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I remember correctly, that two piece setup does use a standard clamp diameter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is at least the possibility, anyway, of running the Team Machine R Aero, not Aero road bike with a uh, with the handlebar of your choosing. So. Uh, while that would be a very expensive way to go on top of what is already a very expensive bike, uh, it is at least an option. Mm. The the limited, the two and the three, which is the you know, spec series, are, um, they come with the one piece and then the four comes with the, the two piece. Um, and I don't know, will, would the four prove the most popular 
anyway because it's the most accessible in terms of price and as such um actually yeah i don't know it's I, certainly it, the least aero aero bike of the aero bikes <laughs> Oh, we can, well, we can do this for days. Um, I mean, it's funny that you bring that up, Ronan. I mean, just one last point before we move on. Uh, by the time this web, uh, by the time this podcast episode goes live, uh, the review that I just wrote of the Trek Madone SL7 should be live on the site. Um, and I actually made the argument that that bike almost makes the most sense out of the uh, new Trek Madone range, even more so than the SLR, uh, actually because it has a two-piece bar and stem setup. Uh, and when I was making the argument that, uh, if you are after an aero bike, uh, it's far more important to, I mean, yes, you want to have a bike that is an, is in and of itself aerodynamic. Um, but it's far more important to be able to get a position where you, the rider is also aerodynamic and more important, I'd say, uh, and running a two piece setup like that, that gives you a little bit more positioning flexibility and a little bit more choice in handlebar setup, uh, might actually make more sense. It might actually be the higher performance way to go, even though it's a lower cost option. Totally agree. What is it? So, what is it Dan Bigham says? Get into the most aero position possible and then train yourself to sustain it. <laughs> or something to that effect. Yeah, there you go. The, bo I mean, it's, the body it's, will adapt. I mean, it's wise words from someone who should know, right? <laughs> I, it might be why I'm not sure they're applicable to uh, the entire audience. Um, sure, fair. Us, us mere mortals. He's de he's definitely got a skill for being able to sustain and adapt to positions. Speaking of performance, mm. I, I, I wonder if this is a good place to plug your new performance process pod, Ronan. Is there a bad place to plug it? <laughs> <laughs> if you are interested in performance gains like that, make sure you check out our new members only podcast called performance process or i guess performance process if i was speaking in in, in ronan speak uh ronan when's the first episode just dropped i believe didn't it yes the first episode did uh it was everything our record from uh or with johnny whale who's been behind so many successful our record attempts recently and as we decided to call it in the episode 60 minute pb because in johnny's opinion everybody should do an hour record at least once a year um and of course not all of us would be going for records so 60 minute pb certainly i would not be going for the record but uh yeah i i listened to that episode i, I enjoyed it and well done and I, from what i understand a, a few other thousand people enjoyed it and uh if you're a member you you should jump on and give it a go hmm i think you're doing a slight disservice i think it's a lot more than a few other thousand but uh yeah it's in the thousands <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> the the amount of uh, work went into getting it ready. I'm probably responsible for at least a few of those thousand. Either way, it's mm. worth listening to. So if you haven't already checked that out, please go ahead and sign up and do so. Uh, anyway, moving off road, um, we've been seeing some prototype Princeton Carbon Works mountain bike wheels underneath the likes of Tom Pidcock and Pauline Ferran Bravo this season. Uh, and the company's finally gone public with the things. So we now know they are officially called the Singularis M30 and M26. Uh, that's in reference to their internal widths. So they're carbon fiber, of course. They use the company's, I'd say, maybe kind of trademark, variable, variable depth wavy rim profile. They're light, not too light, like 450 grams for the narrower one and just over 1,500 grams for the M30. They're also it's kind of surprisingly inexpensive for a Princeton Carbon Works wheel, $1,800 US. Uh, but what I find most intriguing about the press release is how they say these wheels are, quote, light, stiff, tough, and durable, unquote. Uh, light, tough, and durable, sure. But do we actually want stiffer mountain bike wheels? Dave, what are your thoughts on this? That's what stood out to me with uh, with that release as well. <clears throat> Firstly, what stood out to me is that I they're, they're heavier than I thought they'd be. Uh, yeah, same. But... Uh, Beyond that, then, yeah, the, the claims of stiffness for, for sheer acceleration and all that are kind of almost feels a little bit dated to me as far as uh, where we're seeing mountain bike wheels go. And and I base that on what's been happening in the downhill scene. So in the downhill scene over the last few years, there's been rumors and more recently people are talking publicly about it because it's actually become quite common uh, that they're they're trying to make their wheels more uh, more compliant than they ever were, and they're actually customizing spoke tensions to to suit tracks and and a lot of that is you know in the past you used to want the theory was to have a a stiff wheel and let the the tire do all the work, whereas now they're 
they're realizing that if if your wheel flexes enough it it doesn't resist the terrain and when you're cornering the wheel can kind of allow the tire to to maintain traction uh and and not bounce the bike so i don't think cross country is all that different in this scenario and i think cross country riders could benefit from those same traction benefits those same control benefits and yeah if you have a a wheel that's too stiff you you sort of just end up having the bike bounce yeah and this isn't even I would say a remotely revolutionary concept either, because yeah, Dave, like you said, uh, I, I'd been hearing for quite a long time about like race mechanics, you know, kind of running particularly soft spoke tensions or low spoke tensions, that sort of thing. Um, but if you look at production wheels, you know, you have stuff like, uh, like the, uh, like the zip three zero motos and the, the new one, um, the new high tops from zip that, you know, those are all, mm-hmm. uh, specifically designed to be softer riding wheels. Um, I, had a set of bird hawk 30s um, those were also very distinctly soft riding um, and those are all wheels that i would say for the ones that i've ridden anyway they did seem like they offered a tangible performance benefit in terms of how well the bike kind of just felt settled on the ground it just didn't seem to quite be like quite as buzzy and like it, i can't say for certain that there was a tangible traction benefit um but it's kind of seemed like there was, and it kind of, I mean, it certainly gave me some more confidence and it just felt better. Um, but yep. it does seem to be, like you said, like maybe a little bit argu- arguably almost a little behind the times that, uh, that Princeton Carbon Works is talking about stiffness for these mm-hmm. wheels. Um, because it does seem like the trend is for people to be going softer. Yeah. Yeah. And to be clear, like we haven't ridden these wheels, maybe they ride comparably to other great wheels, but, but yeah, it does. Yeah. As James has said, it's, an odd claim to make so anyway so yeah maybe we'll try and get a set in we'll see we'll talk to them um last on the news front uh wolf tooth it's a company out in minnesota that make a lot of cnc machined aluminum uh, uh, accessories uh they just announced some zero millimeter offset chain rings for sram's transmission drivetrains uh a few handful of sizes 30 32 34 36 teeth uh i would say Particularly given the newness of that drivetrain, I'd say more options for replacement parts are certainly good. Um, but all of these offsets and sizes and stuff are also pretty confusing. Yeah, James, I haven't seen this release. What's what are these chain rings for? Uh, they're basically Wolf Tooth just announced uh, they have aftermarket chain rings for transmission. Right. Okay. So, so like if you've got a an existing transmission crank. Correct. An XO, so an XX, XX, yep. SL, GX. Yep. yep. Okay. So they had done three mil and six mil offsets and stuff before, but now they're doing zero yep. millimeter offsets. Um, but uh, this question actually popped up on one of our members only Discord channels. Um, there was a discussion maybe just a couple weeks ago. Someone was asking about chain rings for a SRAM power meter. Um, how the heck are people supposed to figure out what chain rings they need these days? They cannot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, end of story. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I mean, uh, props to yeah. I mean, to Shram for forcing people to dro- uh, join private communities such as Escape Collective, so you can ask questions like these in a, in a safe place and, and actually get very good answers. Uh, yeah, it's it's incredibly confusing out there, and uh, I think there's even a lot of mechanics who who don't even know the answers to these things. But but yeah, fundamentally, it's if you really have no idea, then that's probably the time that you you go visit your local shop and and have them order the right thing for you. Yeah, because you not only have different mounting patterns, but you've got different offsets now, different tooth compatibilities. Uh, it's it's just all over the place. Oval, round, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. It it's a mess. And then you've got you know boost and super boost, and it's 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 un, it's unpleasant. So uh, Wolf Tooth, I would say, in addition to announcing these new chain rings, they do at least have a very handy tech guide to help people figure out what chain rings they need. Uh, I would like to hope that every company offering aftermarket chain rings for these sorts of things do that, but I know that they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, if you'd like a little bit of a little, kind of a little bit more detail on how all this stuff works in general, it's even if you're not in the market for chain rings, I'd advise going over to Wolf Tooth's website and just kind of checking that article and just kind of do a little self-education there. Just for fun to read about different offsets and bolt patterns of cranks. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like how every now and then I just kind of crack open my old grad school textbooks and just, you know, do some little casual reading. You know, mm. stuff like that. Anyway. What a Friday night. 
for Thursday night. Are you kidding? Why wait until the weekend? <laughs> uh, all right, one last thing to add to the news. Gravel World Championships just wrapped up in Italy, and uh, they're pretty good races from what we could see, although we unfortunately couldn't watch the women's race because that wasn't televised. Uh, the men's race uh, certainly was a good race, but one thing that was interesting from the tech perspective was that winner Mate Mahoric seemed to be on a new Merida that we hadn't seen before. Dave, what can you tell us about this thing? Yeah, so Bike Radar got uh, got a piece, have a piece up on this, and uh, yeah, it's a new Merida Silex, which is unreleased, but very clearly what it is, and that there's a, a new kind of all-rounder gravel bike coming from the Taiwanese bike company and uh yeah looks like a carbon frame with a few distinctive new uh frame profiles and all that it doesn't look to have anything too wild as far as design goes and uh I guess that's to be expected of Merida they don't tend to do anything too crazy uh but yeah it I'm sure it's going to be a, a good value bike but to me what stood out was that uh the company not so long ago we're talking probably just a, a few months ago uh released the Sculptura Endurance GR for, for gravel. It was kind of pitched as like this sporty gravel bike. Uh, it's basically like a gravel spec of their Sculptura Endurance uh, carbon road bike. Uh, and yeah, you would have probably assumed that uh, Mahoric would have been on that rather than a, an unreleased, arguably more bike packy kind of bike. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And I think it probably boils down to the geometry of that sculpture endurance which is very endurancey very tall stack uh, and perhaps yeah it tells me that maybe the silex isn't as tall I, maybe yeah that sort of endurance stack generally is not not super compatible with pro racers like that yeah and we do know that Mahoric is um well let's just say he would he would make a fitting guest for the geek warning show given that he is quite the the tech nerd uh, from what we yes. understand um and that he did also have quite a long stem on this new bike so um he's obviously trying to replicate his road setup on the gravel bike that he was racing um, Yeah, so sizing down and mm, yeah, yeah. Th- well maybe not even sizing down i just thought the bike probably has shorter reach um but, you know, mm. I know it's something that I would have done in the past is try to replicate my road position on a gravel bike. And even in the right size, you're having to go for a 13 stem or whatever. Uh, anyway, the point I was going to get to was that um, the most interesting thing about this side X for me was just how good it looks compared to the existing model, which looked just all out of proportions for some reason. Yeah. 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 The Sculpture Endurance is a bike. Uh, I reviewed it the the last place, and I don't know the it's got such an open front triangle. It kind of looks a bit like a farm gate, so it's uh, <laughs> it's not a bad bike by any means, and and at least where it's available, and like certainly in Australia, it's it's fantastic value for money. But but yeah, it wasn't uh, super aesthetically pleasing. I, I thought the existing Silex looked like something heavy had fallen on it, and it had like squatted down. Um, mm. but, don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, new Silex looks good, but uh, James, wasn't there also a new bike in the women's category? There was, as a matter of fact, and we've been seeing we've been seeing pro riders been uh, they've been on Canyon's new Grail on and off for much of this season's gravel races, and Cassian Niwadoma won on that new Canyon Grail, which has now been announced officially as of today. Uh, so I've been riding that thing for the last few weeks. I've got a full review and lots of info up on escapecollective.com. Uh, so definitely go ahead over there and check it out. But that is an interesting bike because I guess to just a very, very quick overview, whereas the existing Grizzle or whereas the existing Grail and Grizzle were pretty close in terms of overlap, uh, Canyon finally pulled those two lines apart and the grail is now it's supposedly much more intended to be for gravel racing it's like it's all aero and it's kind of stretched out for more stable handling and it's interesting brennan uh the question i want to know is cp0018 or not it is not it actually yes. it uses an it actually uses an inch and an eighth round steer tube up top i don't believe it and does the handlebar resemble a tourist bust of london 
does not. It is a single decker bar. It's no longer a double decker bar. It is it it is pretty st still oddly shaped. Uh, the handlebar is definitely still not necessarily to my liking. Uh, yeah, we were talking earlier about handlebar widths in aerodynamics and stuff like that. And considering that Canyon is pitching this as uh, I think it's something like nine watts faster than the old Grail. It's got all these aero tube shapes and whatever. Um, the fact that there are so few cockpit uh, cockpit sizes available, and most of them have surprisingly wide grip widths. Like the, I think the size small Grail that I had here has a forty two centimeter hood to hood center uh, center to center width, which is quite wide, especially considering that they're also flared uh, and considering that this mm. thing is supposed to be aero. So uh, do they make a narrower one? They, they do have an optional like pro only cockpit that they are going to make available, um, but they don't sell that stock on the bikes. And there's, as we've come to find out with other Canyon bikes with one piece cockpits, they don't really give you the option of picking one when you order the bike. Uh, that's kind of a bummer. Well, the the good thing about halving the number of handlebars you have on the bike is that you also half the amount of drag that you've got. So by doing away the double decker, <laughs> perhaps they can still be wider without the without incurring an, an aero penalty. Maybe. Well, or they could have done like super double decker and just had like a 42 mil at the bottom and then you still have the flare drops and then you have like a 36 mil grip height at the with the hoods on a, like a second layer. Like maybe would that work? You, you and the mills again. Are you advocating for a double decker? No, triple okay. decker. Triple decker. <laughs> triple decker. Centimeters. God, centimeters, millimeters, whatever. It's a, it's just a they're they're just zeros. Yeah, I know they're, they're not. Meaningless. I know that I know they're not freedom units, but you know sometimes we do follow the <laughs> yeah SI standards. And anyway, we're just gonna go back to talking in terms of Red Bull cans. Anyway, yeah. Uh, full details of that new Grail are up on the site, as I mentioned. So make sure you go check that out. Uh, very interesting bike, lots of interesting tech details. So uh, certainly more info that I feel like we can talk about here without taking up a huge amount of time. Because one thing that we really did want to talk about is uh, how we are thinking about covering tech news in general. Um, because we have certainly covered a fair bit of that on the podcast and maybe not so much on the site. And there has been a reason for that. And we're probably going to go more, more in that direction. So Dave, what are we looking at there? What are we proposing here? Yeah, we just, we just published a piece on this and there's some good conversation on, 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 uh, escapecollective.com. Uh, certainly join in into that conversation if, if you have some feelings about this, but yeah, basically we, there's only so many hours in the day for, for us and we're a team of three tech editors at the moment and, we're trying to prioritize our time on content that you can't really get elsewhere. And what we've found ourselves doing is sort of, uh, yeah, doing news pieces and telling you what's new on the site, uh, which is content you can get elsewhere. Uh, and that's type of stuff sort of takes a day or two to put together and it comes at the cost of uh, creating unique content. So yeah, we're kind of uh, thinking pulling back on the stuff you can find elsewhere and really trying to prioritize our time on creating unique content that hopefully sways you into believing that a membership is worth it with us. Right. Because ultimately what I think we've decided and what we generally agreed on as far as what our members expect from us is that you all want to know what we actually think of this stuff. You don't, you don't really want just rehashed press releases and stuff like that because the fact of the matter is you can get that pretty much anywhere. Yep. Um, and honestly, if, if publications are still doing a whole lot of that, the reality is AI is about to take over a lot of those jobs anyway. So, <laughs> uh, But ultimately, yes, you do want to hear what we think about this stuff. And it's really hard to do that when we don't have the stuff actually in hand and don't have enough time to spend on this stuff. Yep. So uh, yeah, we're, we're currently evaluating how we're going to be doing tech news. And the general consensus is that if we do not have something to add, then we just may not cover it at all. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. And we'll see how this goes as we move forward. It's not set in stone, certainly open for discussion. Uh, Ronan, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that it's not set in stone and it won't always be straightforward either. Um, you know, as, as that piece alludes to, there will be there will be news items that we will cover. But then also, I wanted to give the example of uh, the piece I wrote in the Panarello Dogma X, which is obviously an interesting bike for a, a heck of a lot of different reasons. Um, but I guess to give a bit of an insight into how we came to write an article about that one particular bike, 
when other news stories we you know we 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 just simply don't have the time to cover. Um, and I think it's interesting because, well, first of all, we were approached by Panarello's representatives pretty well in advance of that bike being announced and asked if we wanted to attend, attend a media launch event, uh, to which I sort of took the process that we always do, is like try to decipher whether or not it's interesting to our audience, to our members. Um, and when I couldn't really get answers on that because their representatives were not in a position to tell me anything about that bike, uh, and given the sort of time constraints that we had, I simply had to make the decision that I I couldn't come out to go into an event that would take up more or less a week from the dates that were involved. Uh, and that would be a week that I would be away from my laptop effectively. Um, fast forward to the couple of days before the launch, why that event had already taken place and the press release came out and we seen that it's got X's all over the place. And that obviously is an interesting bike. And there's questions about, you know, what are Panarello uh, achieving with that design? What's that all about? We want to know. And then Q and are on the presentation, which is fine. Uh, but then another, uh, at least one more conference call with Panarello to follow up with that. And then two days writing up that story uh, to cover a bike that I had never actually sat on. Um, and, and, you know, long story short, now Panarello are sending a test bike for long-term review. I think, I think the, so it'll be another, God knows how many rides and how many hours writing up the actual long-term review. I think what we would prefer to do and what we think works better for, especially for our readers, is if the if we had that bike, not that bike, but any product long enough in advance to have a, a, a proper review ready for uh, um, yeah. when an embargo was left or whatever. Yeah, so, so what we're basically trying to avoid here is that we've done this a few times, James, myself, Ronan, we've all done this over the last six months and we certainly did it at the old place, but basically we'd, we wouldn't get the bike in time for the brand embargo that would say, you know, we're now going live with this bike. Everyone can talk about it. And so we felt pressured, you know, cause our readers come to us and they want to hear what's news. So, uh, what's new. And so we felt kind of this pressure to, to tell you what's new and, but we didn't have the product. So we'd write up the piece saying like, this is what you should expect. These are the features. This is sort of our concerns. This is kind of what we think about it, but we haven't actually used it yet. And you can expect a full review in future. And then that full review would take even more time. So what we're trying to avoid is that overlap and that duplication of our resources. So basically what we're asking for is for brands to, to understand where we're coming from on this and that we're not going to, to duplicate our, our time onto a, a single one product. You know, If we don't have it in our hands, we're probably not going to write about it. We're going to wait until we have it and then we can actually put a conclusion on that written piece and, and be done with it. I think the conclusion is a key part there because at least whenever I'm reviewing, and I think it's uh, both of you have sort of passed this knowledge on to me, is that when we're reviewing these products, we're obviously in a luxury position where we have the chance to to try out these new things. And it's very important to convey what that is like, what that experience is like for, well, A, for the customer who may well be considering purchasing one of these, which Always, always weighs heavy on my mind that someone may well spend money on the bike that they're uh, that they're re- re- reading my opinions on, um, but also for the person you know who might never have the chance to buy it, but just wants to know. It's like watching Jeremy Clarkson drive a Ferrari. I'm never going to have a Ferrari, but you kind of want to know his opinion. Well, maybe not Jeremy's, yeah. but you get the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and first ride reviews, which inevitably when we get a bike too late and we have to or we don't have to but we do do a first ride review we always have to caveat that with caveat that with i've only had two rides in this bike or i've only had one ride in this bike or whatever it might be and at that point at least in my book everything i've written to that point then is is up for debate um you know can you can you put your your confidence in that review if i've if i've had if i'm having to caveat it so that's why yeah it's it's a waste of our time because then we feel like we still need to come back with a full review uh and it's a waste of our readers time because they're not a confident in at, you know the lack of conclusion so yeah it's just something we want to get away from it's it's something a lot of media in the industry does just because that's just the game we're in but yeah hopefully our our membership model lets us move away from that and be different yeah, and it also I think eliminates some confusion because uh, 
Dave, I know you have run into this. Uh, Ronan, maybe you've picked up it on this as well, but uh, oftentimes when we had written up those articles based just on a press release or a media kit or something, uh, oftentimes those articles are referred to by our readers in the comments or whatnot as a review. Like that that word is very much in there, even though yeah. we definitely do not refer to it as a review. Yeah. Um, so it is Even though we state the name, obvious or the opposite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it is important for us to make very clear to people when something is you know when an when a when a, a product is something that we've had the ability to evaluate ourselves firsthand versus something that we are just sort of kind of reporting on stated features and that sort of thing that that's a very different thing uh and i think it's important to try and get rid of that confusion too so anyway um like Dave mentioned, we did publish an article on this recently on Escape Collective. So uh, if you'd like to be part of that discussion, and hopefully you're a member, so you can do that, you can head over to the site and find that article uh, and chime in with your thoughts and let us know. Because again, this is not set in stone and we're open to discussion here. Yeah. And if you're part of the bike industry, then there's also a little a little uh, wish list in there for you to, to check out. Uh, and if you're not listening to this this week, if you're listening to this in the future, uh, well, hello, future. Uh, secondly, uh, you can search for that as our vision for covering tech news. Just um, oh, good one. if you want to find it easily in future. Hmm. How forward thinking of you. <laughs> I don't know how. I think it's the time zone shift. I'm feeling much better for this podcast. Oh, we're, interesting. Hey, we're recording that? at 9 p.m. instead of, uh, well, it's usually verging on 11 p.m. for me by the time we finish up. So mm. um, I am I am trying to, I don't know if it's been done yet, but uh, we will have in the footer of our website announcements and uh, articles like that will be found there. Hmm. Well, I can your forward one. thinking also then. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> right back at you. All right. Well, let's, uh, Dave, should we go ahead and wrap up with a PSA here and then just call it a day? I, I have a short PSA based, oh. on, a, based on a story that uh, was conveyed to me over the weekend. Uh, and that PSA is, if you're sitting in an airport waiting to board a flight listening to this podcast, please momentarily remove your headphones and check that your flight is not already boarding because <laughs> we would not want someone to be deeply engrossed in their work on their, on their laptop and uh, with us in their ears, meaning that they may or may not have missed announcements calling them and final calling them for a flight that was leaving that was taking them on to a connecting flight. Uh, which would mean that if you miss the first flight, you miss both flights. Um, so yeah, if you're listening to this in airport, please uh, keep an eye on and, on your boarding and, gate. And if you're that person, please leave us a review saying this podcast is so good, it's worth missing my family over. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, true well, story. <laughs> the 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 actual PSA I wanted to mention. Uh, as I already said, Ronan and I and everyone else in the Northern Hemisphere, we are about to head into autumn and winter here, uh, which for a lot of people is going to mean riding in inclement weather. And this is just a little word of advice. If you have not pulled the seat post out of your frame in quite a while, uh, you may want to do that uh, just for one, to make sure that you can't actually still remove the seat post out of your frame. Uh, but two, also maybe just to kind of clean that out and apply grease or carbon paste as needed and just kind of make sure that area is nice and clean so that uh, as you're heading into riding in ugly weather, that that seat post doesn't get seized in there over the winter. To add to that, um, often I'd say when people do do that, they ignore the seat clamp uh, and that the seat clamp, like regardless of whether it's kind of a wedge style that's hidden in the frame or it's an external clamp tends to get pretty manky like get, gets covered in all sorts of grit and, and crud and even sweat i would say whatever that c-clamp is uh probably remove it clean it grease the the sliding surfaces of it or grease the bolt and and reassemble it and put it back in in place because uh not doing that will greatly affect the the torque that you're actually uh are getting like it, it's gonna uh basically create a a reduced uh, clamping force for the torque figure that you're getting from it. Um, but yeah, also it'll just uh, make it all work nicely and prevent you from potentially having a stripped bolt in future as well. If uh, I'm thinking of specifically Penarello's now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's and certainly BMCs. And BMCs, but yeah, there's certainly designs that, you know, th those bolts will get, pretty rusty and corroded and then yeah it doesn't take much to then strip the head of them so keeping them nicely greased and clean is is good practice and 
makes perfect sense to do it while the C post is out. I'm gonna have to disagree with you here, Dave. Oh no, what are you going? Can't think of anything better for my time on the bike than a C's C post, C's seat clamp, C's the cleats, C's the handlebar, C's everything that I, so that I'm not constantly adjusting and tweaking and <laughs> tinkering with my bike. Mount. <laughs> so that might actually be a good thing in some cases. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, geez. I'm not sure I can en- I, I'm not sure I can endorse that that mm. that uh that position running. Ronan. Ronan's basically saying skip the carbon paste, go straight to it and uh, a spray adhesive glue. Yes. A salt bath. Mm. Yeah. Um yeah, okay. Well each to their own, Ronan. <laughs> each to their own. <laughs> <laughs> as as Pinarello is contemplating sending that dogma X to Ronan for a test. Hmm. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Geek Morning. As always, thanks so much for listening. Uh, as mentioned already, if you're not already a member, please do so. Because if you're not, well, you're going to miss out on a bunch of stuff that we have coming out, especially a whole bunch of members-only paid Geek Warning podcasts. Uh, also, the ability to comment on articles and take a look at all of the content on the site. Um, if you are not a member, if you don't have any intention of signing up, okay, we can live with that. But at least head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review uh, for Geek Warning because that is at least very helpful because it gets more people to find the show, which we like talking to more people. So anyway, that is our ask for this week. So that will do it, like I said, for this week's episode, and we will see you next week. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.